Shri Chaitanya Manovitsam, Sapitam Nina Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadamayam, Tadati Swapatantikam, Vandeham Shri Guru, Shri Uta Padakamalam, Shri Guru Vaishnavam Stra, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvetam Savatutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Sri Radha Krishna Padam, Sahagana Radita, Sri Vishakam Vitamscha, He Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandhu Jagapati, Gopisha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostate, Tapta Kanchana Gorangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vishabhanu Sute Devi, Ranamami Hari Priye, Panchaka Pata Rubyascha, Ripa Sindhu Bhayevacha, Patita Nam Kavane Vyo, Vaishnave Vyo Namo Namaha. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara, Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Niti Amine. Namaste Sarasati Deve, Gauravani Pajarini, Nilisesha Sunyavari, Pasya Chare Jatarini. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So, yeah. Oh, chapter 17. Okay. Chapter 17 on the Bowery. We're here. It's getting hot. Would anyone like to start reading? Maha Mantra Babu. Like a bullet from a gun. Yeah, no, I think, I think if I can go first, because uh, I might be expecting a call halfway through. So if I read first, it'd be beneficial to me thank you and everyone else hopefully um, so chapter 17 on the bowery i couldn't understand the difference between friends and enemies my friend was so just get rid of the windows my friend was shocked to hear that i was moving to the bowery but although i passed through many dangers i never thought that this is danger everywhere i thought this is my home should have had in conversation april 1966 Someone broke into room 307 while Srila Brahmapad was out and stole his typewriter and tape recorder. When Brahmapad returned to the building, the janitor informed him of the theft. An unknown burglar had broken broke the transom glass, climbed through, taken the valuables and escaped. As Prabhupada listened, he became convinced that the janitor himself was the culprit. Of course, he couldn't prove it, so he accepted the loss with disappointment. Some friends offered replacement for his old typewriter and tape recorder. In a letter to India, he described the theft as a loss of more than 1,000 rupees, $157. It is understood that such a crime has been committed in my room. It is understood that such crime as has been committed in my room is very common in New York. This is the way of material nature. American people have everything in ample, and the worker gets about 100 rupees a day as daily wages. And still there are thieves for want of character. The social condition is not very good. Prabhupada told Joseph For Forster, the Sindhya ticket agent, that he would be returning to India in a couple of months. That was seven months ago. Now, for the first time since his arrival, Prabhupada had returned to the Sindhya ticket office in Brooklyn. He talked about the theft to Mr. Forster, who responded with, Welcome to the club, and told Prabhupada about the recent theft of his own automobile. Such things, he explained, were not unusual for New York City. He told Prabhupada of the dangers of the city and how to avoid thefts and muggings. Prabhupada listened, shaking his head. He told Mr. Forster that American young people were misguided and confused. He discussed his plans for returning to India and showed Mr. Forster one of his Bhagavatams. 
Robert Page had lost his spirit for living in room 307. What would prevent the journey, what would prevent the journey to from stealing again? Harvey Cohen and Bill Epstein had advised him to relocate downtown and had assured him of a more interesting following there among the young people. It had been an attractive proposal and he began to reconsider it. Then Harvey offered Robert Page his own studio on the Bowery. Harvey had been working as a commercial artist for a Madison Avenue advertising firm when a recently acquired inheritance had spurred him to move into a loft on the Bowery to pursue his own career as a painter. But he was becoming disillusioned with New York. A group of acquaintances addicted to heroin had been coming around and taking advantage of his generosity and his loft had recently been burglarized. He decided to leave the city and go to California, but before leaving, he offered his flat, he offered his loft for Prabhupada to share with David Allen. David Allen had heard that Harvey Cohen was moving to San Francisco, he could sublet his AIR loft. Harvey didn't know, Harvey, sorry, Harvey hadn't known David very long, but on the night before Harvey was supposed to leave, he coincidentally met David three different times in three different places on the Lower East Side. Harvey took this as a sign that he should rent the loft to David, but he specifically stipulated that the Swami should move in too. As Prabhupada was leave, preparing to leave his 72nd Street address, an acquaintance, an electrician who worked in the building, came to warn him. The Bowery was no place for a gentleman, he protested. It was the most corrupt place in the world. Prabhupada things had been stolen from room 0307, but moving to the Bowery was not the answer. Yeah, uh, just... Let someone else take over there, if that's okay. Still up on new home, the Bowery, had a long history. In the early 1600s, when Manhattan was known as New Amsterdam and was controlled by the Dutch West India Company, Peter Minuit, the governor of New Netherland, staked out a north-south road that was called the Bowery because a number of Bowery's or farms lay on either side. It was a dusty country road lined with quaint Dutch cottages and bordered by the peach orchards, orchards growing in the estate of Peter Stuyvesant. It became part of the high road to Boston and was of strategic importance during the American Revolution as the only land entrance to New York City. In the early 1800s, the Bowery was predominated by German immigrants. Later in the century, it became predominantly Jewish and gradually it became the city center of theatrical life. However, as a history of Lower Manhattan describes, after 1870 came the period of the Bowery's celebrated degeneration. Fake auction rooms, saloons, spe saloons specializing in five cent whiskey and knockout drops, sensational dime museums, filthy and rat-ridden stale beer dives, together with Charles M. Hoyt's song, The Bowery, The Bowery, I'll never go there anymore, fixed it forever in the nation's conscience as a place of unspeakable corruption. The reaction of Prabhupada's electrician friend was not unusual. The Bowery is still known all over the world as Skid Row, a place of ruined and homeless alcoholics. Perhaps the uptown electrician had done business in the Bowery and had seen the derelicts sitting around passing a bottle or lying unconscious in the gutter or staggering up to passers-by and drunkenly bumping into them to ask for money. Most of the Bowery's seven or eight thousand homeless men slept in lodging houses that required them to vacate their rooms during the day. Having nowhere else to go and nothing else to do, they would loiter on the street, standing silent, silently on the sidewalks, leaning against a wall or shuffling slowly along, alone or in groups. In cold weather, they would wear two coats and several suits of clothing at once and would sometimes warm themselves around a fire they would keep going in a city garbage can. At night, those without lodging slept on the sidewalks, doorsteps and street corners crawled into discarded boxes or sprawled side by side next to the bars. Thefts were commonplace. A man's pockets might be searched 10 or 25, 20 times whilst, while he slept. The rates of hospitalization and death in the Bowery 
were five times higher than the national average, and many of the homeless men bore marks of recent injuries or violence. Prabhupada's loft 94 Bowery was six blocks south of Houston Street. At Houston and Bowery, derelicts converged in the heavy crosstown traffic. When cars stopped for the light, bums would come up and wash their windshields and ask for money. South of Houston, the first blocks held mostly restaurant supply stores, lamp stores, taverns, and luncheonettes. The buildings were of three and four stories, old, narrow, crowded tenements, their faces covered with heavy fire escapes. Traffic on the Barry ran uptown and downtown. Cars parked on both sides of the street and a constant traffic passing tightly. During the business day, working people passed briskly, walking um, briskly among the slow moving derelicts. Many of the store windows were covered with protective iron gates, but behind the gates, the store owners lit their varieties of lamps to attract prospect wholesale and retail customers. 94 Barry was just two doors north of Hester Street. The corner was occupied by a station by the spacious Half Moon Tavern, which was frequently which was frequented most mostly by neighborhood alcoholics. Above the tavern sat a four-story Bowery blockhouse marked by a neon sign, Palmer House. Oh. Sorry, Mantra. Um, just need to enlarge the screen again. So. Yeah. Sorry, would someone else like to carry on? We've got technical problems. We can carry on and then just tell us when you're ready to go. Oh, we're through. back. Okay. Um, um, above the tavern set a four story. That's a four-story Bowery flop house. Um, marked by a neon sign, Palmer House, which was covered by a protective metal cage and hung from the second floor on large chains. The hotel's entrance at 92 Bowery, which had no lobby but only a desolate hallway covered with dirty white tiles, was no more than six feet from the entrance to 94. 94 Bowery was a narrow four-story building. It had long ago been painted gray and bore the usual face facing of a massive black fire escape. A well-worn black double door with glass panels reinforced with chicken wire opened onto the street. The sign above the door read AIR third and fourth, indicating that artists in residence occupied these floors. The first floor of the building north, 96 Bowery, was used for storage and its first entrance was covered with a rusty iron gate. At 98 Bowery was another tavern, Harold's, smaller and ding dingier than the half moon. Thus the block consisted of two saloons, a flop house and two buildings with lofts. In the 1960s, loft living was just beginning in that area of New York City. The city had given permission for painters, musicians, sculptors, and other artists who required more space than available in most apartments to live in buildings that had been constructed as factories in the 19th century after these abandoned factories had been fitted with fireproof doors, bathtubs, shower stalls, and heating, an artist could inexpensively use a large space. These were the AIR locks. Harvey Cohen's loft on, top, on the top floor of 94 Bowery was an open space almost 100 feet long from east to west and 25 feet wide. 
It received a good amount of sunlight on the east, the Bowery side, and it also had windows at the west end, as well as a skylight. The exposed rafters of the ceiling were 12 feet above the floor. Harvey Cohen had used the loft as an art studio and racks for painting still lined the walls. A kitchen and shower were partitioned off in the northwest corner and a room divider stood about 15 feet from the Bowery side windows. This divider did not run from wall to wall, but was open at both ends and it was several feet short of the ceiling. It was behind this partition that Prabhupada had his personal living area. A bed and a few chairs stood near the window and Prabhupada's typewriter sat on his metal trunk next to the small table that held his stacks of Bhagavatam manuscripts. His dhotis hung drying on the clothesline. On the other side of the partition was a dais, about 10 feet wide and 5 feet deep, on which Prabhupada sat during his kirtans and lectures. The dais faced west toward the loft's large open space. Open, that is, except for a couple of rugs and an old-fashioned so solid wood table, and on an easel, Harvey's painting of Lord Chaitanya dancing with his associates. The loft was a four-flight walk-up, and the only entrance, usually heavily bolted, was a door in the rear, at the west end. From the outside, this door opened into a hallway, lit only by a red exit light over the door. The hallway led to the right a few steps and into the open area. If a guest entered during a kirtan or a lecture, he would see the Swami about 30 feet from the entrance, seated on his dais. On other evenings, the whole loft would be dark, but for the glow of the red exit light in the little hallway and the soft illumination radiating from the other side of the partition where Prabhupada was working. Somebody else like to continue? Mm -hmm. Hello? Can you hear us? Okay. Thank you, Shiva. There you go. You go. Okay. Yeah. We have power in the bowery. Yeah. Parapad lived on the Bowery, sitting under a small light, while hundreds of derelicts also sat under hundreds of naked lights on the same city block. He had no more fixed income than the derelicts, nor any greater security of a fixed residence. Yet his consciousness was different. He was translating Srimad Bhagavatam into English, speaking to the world through his Bhaktivedanta purport. His duty, whether on the 14th floor of a Riverside Drive apartment building, or in the corner of a Bowery lock, was to establish Krishna consciousness as the prime necessity for all humanity. He went on with his translating and with his constant vision of a Krishna temple in New York City. Because his consciousness was absorbed in Krishna's universal mission, he did not depend on his surroundings for shelter. Home for him was not a matter of bricks and wood, but of taking shelter of Krishna in every circumstance. As Parapad had said to his friends uptown, everywhere is my home. Whereas without Krishna's shelter, the whole world would be a desolate place. Often he would re refer to a scriptural statement that people live in three different modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Life in the forest is the mode of goodness. Life in the city is in passion. And the life in a degraded place like a liquor shop, a brothel, or the bowery is in the mode of ignorance. But to live in the temple of Vishnu is to live in the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, which is transcendental to all three material modes. And this bowery loft where Parapad was holding his meetings and performing kirtan was also transcendental. When he was behind the partition, working in his corner before the open pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, that room was as good as his room back at the Radha Damodar temple in Vrindavan. News of the Swami's move to the Bowery loft spread, mostly by word of mouth at the Paradox restaurant, and people began to come by in the evening to chat with him. The musical kirtans were especially popular on the Bowery, since the Swami's new congregation consisted mostly of local mu musicians and artists, 
who responded more to the transcendental music than to the philosophy. Every morning he would hold a class on Srimad Bhagavatam, attended by David Allen, Robert Nelson, and another boy, and occasionally he would teach cooking to whoever was interested. He was usually available for personal talks with any inquiring visitors or with his new roommate. Although Prabhupada and David each had a designated living area in the large loft, the entire place soon became dominated by Prabhupada's preaching activities. Prabhupada and David got on well together, and at first Prabhupada considered David an aspiring disciple. April 27th. He wrote to his friends in India describing his relationship with David Allen. He was attending my class at 72nd Street along with the others, and when I experienced this theft case in my room, he invited me to his residence. So I am with him and training him. He has good prospect because already he has given up all bad habits. In this country, illicit connection with women, smoking, drinking and eating of meats are common affairs. Besides that, there are other bad habits like using only toilet paper and not bathing after evacuating, etc. But by my request, he has given up 90% of his old habits and he is chanting Maha Mantra regularly. So I am giving him the chance and I think he is improving. Tomorrow I have arranged for some prasadam distribution and he has gone to purchase some things from the market. When David first came to the Bowery, he appeared like a clean cut college student. He was 21 six feet tall, blue-eyed, handsome and intelligent looking. Most of his new friends in New York were older and considered him a kid. David's family lived in East Lansing, Michigan, and his mother was paying $100 monthly to sublease the loft. Although he did not have much experience, he had read that a new realm of mind expansion was available through psychedelic drugs and he was heading fast into the hazardous world of LSD. His meeting with the Swami came at a time of radical change and, profo and profoundly affected his life. David, it was a really good relationship I had with the Swami, but I was overwhelmed by the tremendous energy of being that close to him. It spurred my consciousness very fast. Even my dreams at night would be so vivid of Krishna consciousness. I was often sleeping when the Swami was up because he was up late in the night working on his translations. That's possibly where a lot of the consciousness and dreams just flowed in because of that deep relationship. It also had to do with studying Sanskrit. There was a lot of immediate impact with the language. The language, language seemed to have such a strong mystical quality the way he translated it word for word. Would somebody else like to read? Prabhupada's old friend from uptown, Robert Nelson, continued to visit him on the Bowery. He was impressed by Prabhupada's friendly relationship with David, who he saw was learning many things from Swami. Mr. Robert bought a small American-made hand organ similar to an Indian harmonium and donated it to David for chanting with Prabhupada. At seven in the morning, Mr. Robert would come by and after Bhagavatam class, he would talk informally with Prabhupada telling his ideas for making records and selling books. He wanted to continue helping the Swami. They would sit in chairs near the front window and Mr. Robert would listen while Prabhupada talked for hours about Krishna and Lord Chaitanya. New people began coming to see Prabhupada on a bowery. Carol Jergens, a 30-year-old black man from the Bronx, had attended Cornell University and was now independently studying Indian religion and Zen Buddhism. He had experimented with drugs as psychedelic tools and he had an interest in the music and poetry of India. He was influential along with his friends and tried to interest them in meditation. He had even been dabbling in Sanskrit, Carol. I had just finished reading a book called The Wonder That Was India. I had gotten the definition of a sannyasi and a brahmachari and so forth. There was a vivid description in that particular book of how you could see a sannyasi coming down the road with a saffron robe. 
it must have made more than just a superficial impression on me because it came to me this one chilly evening. I was going to visit Michael Grant, probably going to smoke some marijuana and sit around, maybe play some music. And I was coming down Hester Street. If you make a left on Bowery, you can go up to Mike's place on Grant Street. But it's funny that I chose to go that way because the shorter way would have been to go down Grand Street. But if I had gone that way, I'd probably have missed Swamiji. So I decided to go down Hester and then make a left. All of a sudden, I saw in this dingy alcove a brilliant saffron robe. As I passed, I saw the Swamiji knocking on the door, trying to gain entrance. There were two bums hunched up against the door. It was like a two-part door. One of them was sealed and the other was locked. The two bums were lying on either side of Swamiji. One of these men was, had actually expired, which often happened. You had to call the police or the health department to get them. I don't think I saw the men lying in the doorway until I walked up to Swamiji and asked him, are you a sannyasi? And he answered, yes. We started this conversation about how he was starting a temple. And he mentioned Lord Chaitanya, an old thing. He just came out with this flow of strange things to me right there in the street. But I knew he was talking about, I knew what he was talking about somehow. I had the formality, familiarity of having just read the book and delved into Indian religion. So I knew that this was a momentous occasion for me and I wanted to help him. We banged on the door and eventually we got into the loft. He invited me to come to a kirtan and I came back later that night for my first kirtan. From that point on, it was fairly, fairly regular thing three times a week. At one point, Swamiji asked me to stay with him. I stayed with him for about two weeks. It was perhaps because of Carl's interest in Sanskrit that Prabhupada began holding Sanskrit classes. Carl and David had a few other and a few others would spend hours learning Sanskrit under Prabhupada's guidance. Using a chalkboard he found in the loft, Prabhupada taught the alphabet and his students wrote their exercises in notebook. Prabhupada would look over their shoulders to see if they were writing correctly and would review their pronunciation. His students were learning not simply Sanskrit, but the instructions of Bhagavad Gita. Each day he would give them a verse to copy in the Sanskrit alphabet Davangari, transliterate into the Roman alphabet, and then translate word for word into English. But their interest in Sanskrit waned, and Prabhupada gradually gave up the daily classes to spend time working on his own translations of the Sriman Bhagavatam. New friends may have regarded these lessons as Sanskrit classes, but actually they were Bhakti classes. He had not come to America as the ambassador of Sanskrit. His Guru Maharaj had ordered him to teach Krishna consciousness. But since he had found in Kao and some of his friends a desire to investigate Sanskrit, he encouraged it. As a youth, Lord Chaitanya had also started Sanskrit school with the real purpose of teaching love of Krishna. He would teach in such a way that every word meant Krishna, and when his students objected, he closed the school. Similarly, when Prabhupada found that his students' interest in Sanskrit was transistory, and since he himself had no mission on behalf of Sanskrit linguistics, he gave it up. By the standard of classic Vedic scholars, it takes 10 years for a boy to master Sanskrit grammar. And if one does not start until his late 20s or 30s, it is usually too late. Certainly none of Swamiji's students were thinking of entering a 10 year concentration in Sanskrit grammar. And even if they were, they would not realize spiritual truth simply by becoming grammarians. Prabhupada thought it better to utilize his own Sanskrit scholarship in translating the verses of Sriman Bhavatam into English, following the Sanskrit commentaries of the previous authorities. Otherwise, the secrets of Krishna consciousness would remain locked away in the Sanskrit. Teaching Karl Jürgen's Devangari, Sandhi, verb conjugations and noun declensions was not going to give the people of America transcendental Vedic knowledge. Better that he utilize his proficiency in Sanskrit for translating many volumes of the Bhagavatam into English for millions of potential readers. Harold Becker came from an immigrant Catholic background and she immediately associated with Catholicism, the Swami's presence as a spiritual authority and his devotional practices of chanting on beads and reciting from Sanskrit scriptures. 
Sometimes she would accompany Prabhupada to nearby Chinatown, where he would purchase ingredients for his cooking. He would cook daily and sometimes Carol and others would come by to learn the secrets of cooking for Lord Krishna. Krishna. Carol, who used to cook with us in the kitchen and who was always aware of everyone else's activities in addition to his own cooking, who knew exactly how things should be, who washed everything and made sure everything, everyone did everything correctly. He was a teacher. He used to make chapatis by hand, but then one day he asked me to get him a rolling pin. I brought a ro my rolling pin and he appropriated it. He put some men on rolling chapatis and supervised them very carefully. I made a chutney for him at home. He always accepted our gifts graciously, although I don't think he ever ate them. Perhaps he was worried we might put in something that wasn't allowed in his diet. He used to take things from me and put them in the cupboard. I don't know what he finally did with them, but I'm sure he didn't throw them away. I never saw him eat anything that I had prepared, although he accepted everything. Prabhupada held this, his evening meetings on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, just as he had uptown. The loft was out of the way for most of his acquaintances and it was on the Bowery. A cluster of sleeping derelicts regularly blocked the street level entrance and visitors would find as many as half a dozen bums to step over before climbing the four flights of stairs. But it was something new. You could go and sit with a group of hip people and watch the Swami lead Kirtan. The room was dimly lit and Prabhupada would burn incense. Many casual visitors came and went. One of them, Gunta, had vivid impressions. Gunta, you walked right off the Bowery into a room filled with incense. It was quiet. Everyone was talking in hushed tones, not really talking at all. Swamiji was sitting in the front of the room and in meditation. There was a tremendous feeling of peace, which I've never had before. I'd happened to have studied for two years to become a minister and was into meditation, study and prayer. But this was my first time to do anything Eastern or Hindu. There were lots of pillows around and mats on the floor for people to sit on. I don't think there were any pictures or statues. It was just Swamiji, incense and mats and obviously the respect of the people in the room for him. Before we went up, Carl was laughing and saying how Swami wanted everyone to use the hand symbols just correctly. I had never played the symbols before, but when it began, when it began, I just tried to follow Swamiji, who was doing it in a certain way. Things were building up, the sound was building up, but then someone was doing it wrong. And Swamiji just very, very calmly shook a finger at someone and they looked and then everything stopped. He instructed this person from a distance and this fellow got the right idea and they started up again. After a few minutes, the sound of the symbols and the incense, we weren't in the Bowery any longer. We started chanting Hare Krishna. That was my first experience in chanting. I'd never chanted before. There's nothing in Protestant religion that comes even close to that. Maybe Catholics with their Hail Marys, but it's not quite the same thing. It was relaxing and very interesting to be able to chant. And I found Swamiji very fascinating. The loft was more open than Prabhupada's previous place uptown. So there was less privacy. And here some of the visitors were skeptical and even challenging, but everyone found him confident and joyful. He seemed to have far reaching plans and he had dedication. He knew what he wanted to do and was single handedly carrying it out. It is not one man's job, he had said, but he went on doing all he could, depending on Krishna for the results. David was beginning to help and more people were coming by to visit him. Does anyone else want to read? Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. 
Um, almost all of Prabhupada's Bowery friends were musicians or friends of musicians. They were into music, music, drugs, women, and spiritual meditation. Because Prabhupada's presentation of the Hare Krishna mantra was both musical and meditative, they were automatically interested. Prabhupada stressed that all the Vedic mantras or hymns were sung. In fact, the words Bhagavad Gita meant the song of God. But the words of the Vedic hymns were incarnations of God in the form of transcendental sound. The musical accompaniment of hand cymbals, drum and harmonium was just that, an accompaniment and had no spiritual purpose independent of the chanting of the name of God. Prabhupada allowed any instrument to be used as long as it did not detract from the chanting. Carol. It was a very interracial, music-oriented scene. There were a few professional musicians and a lot of people who enjoyed playing or just listening. Some people were painting in some of the lofts and that's basically what was going on. We had memorable kirtans. One time there was a beautiful ceremony. Some of us went over early to prepare for it. There must have been a hundred people who came that day. For the Bowery crowd, sound was spirit and spirit was sound, in a merging of music and meditation. But for Prabhupada, music without the name of God wasn't meditation, it was sense gratification or at most, a kind of stylized impersonal meditation. But he was glad to see the musicians coming to play along in his kirtans, to hear him and to chant responsively. Some, having stayed up all night playing somewhere on their instruments, would come by in the morning and sing with the Swami. He did not dissuade them from their focus on sound, rather, he gave them sound. In the Vedas, Sound is said to be the first element of material creation. The source of sound is God, and God is eternally a person. Prabhupada's emphasis was on getting people to chant God's personal transcendental name. Whether they took it as jazz, folk music, rock, or Indian meditation made no difference, as long as they began to chant Hare Krishna. Carol, whenever he had the chanting, the people were fairly in awe of the Swami. On the Bowery, a kind of transcendence came out of the ringing of the cymbals. He used the harmonium, and many people played hand cymbals. Sometimes he played the drum. In the very beginning, he stressed the importance of sound and the realization of Godhead through sound. That was, I suppose, the attraction that these musicians found in him. The emphasis on sound as a means to attaining transcendence and the Godhead. But he wanted a serious thing. He was interested in discipleship. One serious newcomer was Michael Grant. Mike was 24. His father, who was Jewish, owned a record shop in Portland, Oregon, where Mike grew up. After studying music at Portland's Reed College and at San Francisco State, Mike, who played the piano and many other instruments, moved to New York City along with his girlfriend, hoping to get into music professionally. But he quickly became disenchanted with the commercial music scene. Playing in nightclubs and pandering to commercial demands seemed particularly unappealing. In New York, he joined the Musicians' Union and worked as a musical arranger and as an agent for several local groups. Mike lived on the Bowery in an AIR loft on Grand Street. It was a large loft where musicians often congregated for jam sessions. But as he turned more and more to serious composing, he found himself retiring from the social side of the music scene. His interests ran more to the spiritual, quasi-spiritual and mystical books he had been reading. He had encountered several swamis, yogis and self-styled spiritualists in the city and had taken up Hatha Yoga. From his first meeting with the Swami, Mike was interested, quite open, as he was with all religious persons. He thought all genuinely religious people were good, although he did not care to identify with any particular group. Mike. There was a little bit of familiarity because I had seen other Swamis. The way he was dressed, the way he looked, older and swarthy, weren't new to me. 
but at the same time, there was an element of novelty. I was very curious. I didn't hear him talk when I first came in. He was just chanting, but mainly I was waiting to hear what he was going to say. I'd already heard people chant before. I thought, why else would he put himself in such a place without any comfort, unless the message he's trying to get across is more important than his own comfort. I think the thing that struck me the most was the poverty that was all around him. This was curious because the places that I had been before had been just the opposite, very opulent. There was a Vedanta center in Upper Manhattan and others. They were filled with stead older men with their leather chairs and pipe tobacco, that kind of environment. But this was real poverty. The whole thing was curious. The Swami looked very refined, which was also curious that he was in this place. When he talked, I immediately saw that he was a scholar and that he spoke with great conviction. Some statements he made were very daring. He was talking about God, and this was all new to hear someone talk about God. I always wanted to hear someone I could respect talk about God. I always liked to hear religious speakers, but I measured them very carefully. When he spoke, I began to think, well, here is someone talking about God who may really have some realization of God. He was the first one I had come across who might be a person of God who could feel really deeply. Anyone else? Sharanga. Sharanga, you going to read? All right, yeah. Prabhupada is lecturing. Sri Krishna is just trying to place Arjuna on the platform of working in pure consciousness. We have already discussed for so many days that we are not this dull body, but we are consciousness. Somehow or other, we are in contact with matter. Therefore, our freedom is checked. Attendance is better now than it had been uptown. The loft offers a larger space. In fact, the platform where Prabhupada sits nearly equals the area of his entire office cubicle on 72nd Street. The dingy loft with its unpainted rafters is more like an old warehouse than a temple. The members of his audience, most of them musicians, have come to meditate on the mystical sounds of the Swami's kirtan. Carl, Carol, Gunther, Mike... David, the crowd from the Paradox, and others join him on Monday, Wednesday and Friday night when he holds classes beginning punctually at 8 o'clock. The programme consists of half an hour of chanting Hare Krishna followed by a lecture from Bhagavad Gita, usually 45 minutes long, then a question and answer period, and finally another half hour of chanting, everything ending by 10 o'clock. The kirtan has just ended and Swamiji is speaking. As spiritual beings, we are free to act, free to have anything, pure, no contamination, no disease, no birth, no death, no old age. And besides that, we have got many, many other qualifications in our spiritual life. When he speaks, he is pure spiritual form. The Vedic scriptures say that a sadhu, a saint, is not seen but heard. If the people in the audience want to know Swamiji, they will have to hear him. He is no longer simply the old Indian immigrant who lives on the other side of the partition of this loft, hanging his clothes to dry, barely getting his meals. But now he is speaking as the emissary of Lord Krishna, beyond time and space, and hundreds of spiritual masters in the chain of the Siblic succession are speaking through him. He has entered amid New York's Bohemians in 1966, saying that 1966 is temporary and illusory, that he is eternal and they are eternal. This was the meaning of the Kirtan, and now he is explaining it philosophically, advocating a total change in consciousness. Yet knowing that they can't take it all, he urges them to take whatever they can. You will be glad to hear that this process of spiritual realization, once begun, guarantees one to have his next life as a human being. Once karma yoga is begun, it will continue. It doesn't matter. Even if one fails to complete the course, 
Still, he is not loser. He is not loser. Now, if someone begins this yoga of self-realization, but unfortunately cannot prosecute this task in a nice way, if he falls down from the path, still there is encouragement that you are not a loser. You will be given a chance next life, and the next life is not ordinary next life. And for one who is successful, oh, what to speak of him? The successful goes back to Godhead. So we are holding this class, and although you have multifarious duties, you come here thrice a week and try to understand, and this will not go in vain. Even if you stop coming here, that impression will never go. I tell you, the impression will never go. If you do some practical work, that is very, very nice. But if you do not do any practical work, simply if you give your submissive or reception and understand what is the nature of God, if you simply hear and have an idea, even, even then you will be free from this material bondage. Should, should, should I read another paragraph or is someone else, is someone else going to read? Right, Prabhu, it, it's nectar hearing you read. Yeah, if you don't mind, we'd love to hear more. Only if you don't mind. Oh, okay. He is talking to a crowd who are deeply set in their hip life. He knows that they can't immediately give up taking drugs. And, uh, and there they sit with their common law wives. Their path is to play music live with a woman and meditate sometimes and be free. After hearing his lecture, they'll stay up all night with their instruments, their women, their drugs, their interracial bohemian scene. Yet somehow they are drawn to Swamiji. He's got the good vibrations of the Kirtan and they want to help him out. They're glad to, they're glad to help because he has no one else. So Prabhupada is saying to them, that's all right, even if you can only do a little, it will be good for you. We're all pure spirit souls, but you have forgotten. You have fallen into the cycle of birth and death. Whatever you can do toward reviving your original consciousness is good for you. There is no loss. The Swami's main stress is on what he calls dovetailing your consciousness with the Supreme Consciousness. Krishna is the Supreme Consciousness and Arjuna as a representative individual consciousness is asked to act intelligently in collaboration with the Supreme Consciousness. Then he will be free from the bondage of birth, death, old age and disease. Consciousness is a popular word in America. There's consciousness, expansion, cosmic consciousness, altered states of consciousness, and now dovetailing the individual consciousness with the Supreme Consciousness. This is the perfection of consciousness, Prabhupada explains. This is the love and peace that everyone is really after. And yet, Prabhupada talks of it in terms of war. Hi, Hare Krishna. Sarangabhu, thank you so much for doing that. We didn't realize you were here. So sorry that we didn't give you oh, any I more. Knew Did you? I just, I just, ah. I sneaked in late. I just sneaked in late. Snuck in late and sat at the back, but back to Vinoba and let you get away with it. <laughs> so we, we, we had to hear your voice. Thanks. It was so nice hearing you read. Thanks, Prabhu. Jai, Hare Krishna. I think we're going to stop there and have time, some time for yeah, reflection. And uh, if anyone wants to make any comments or anything. Um, I know I had one just while... Uh, oh, back to Vinoba. Sorry, were you just reaching for your thing there? Sorry. Yeah, just go ahead and speak, yeah. Oh, oh okay. Thanks, Prabhu. So I didn't want to cut you off. Um, I, I just saw one thing that uh, Hemmer and I both thought was interesting was Prabhupada did a half-hour kirtan at either end of the class, which obviously it's not unheard of, but sometimes you go to like a program where there's new people and it's not always like that and stuff. I actually had, it was more of a question really for Radha Priya. I don't know if she can hear us, but... I just wondered if she had any uh, like memories or or I don't know insights into if it was any different back then to how we do things. So sometimes things change, isn't it, in the way that you you do things. Going mean, now, sometimes we have like three hour kirtans and we do Radha Desh mellows and all different things like that. But 
I just wondered if Rider Priya. Classes, programming, yeah, I was thinking that. more about that. I just wondered if Rider Priya had any uh, memories or anything to share on that, actually, while she's here, because she was, you know, she was initiated by Parapod and she was. I'm sure around. she'll type it in. Yeah. If she does. If she can't. Yeah. Yeah. So she'll type it. hopefully, while we wait for her, I don't know if anyone else had anything they wanted to share. Yeah, just like the part where um, they said, like, uh, living in the three modes of material nature. But if you're living in a, like, if you've turned your flat or your home or you're in a temple, then it's not like you're living in the three modes of nature. You're um, actually living in a spiritual world. I like that. I like that very much, you know. I like that bit too. I yeah. Feel, doesn't yeah. matter where you are in the world. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I've never. I've never lived in a temple. Yeah. I've lived. I've lived with devotees, like in a house or whatever. But I've never actually lived in a temple, like in a in that formal setting. So well, I. Well, it's the same thing, really. If you, I mean, you turn your house into a temple, really, don't you? If if there's a house and it's just the bodies that are living in there, you can still consider it by Kunta, can't you? It's like, um, yeah, I like that because, um, you know, the city is a mode of passion and like um, degraded places, mode of ignorance and um, like the country is a mode of goodness, but we are transcendentalists. We are supposed to interact within the modes and um, sort of keep a lot, keep a bit aloof from the modes and uh, still uh, be able to practice Krishna consciousness, you know? Because sometimes we have to go into places for the mode of ignorance and mode of passion and give people Krishna, but we somehow or another have to keep our heads above the water, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I remember um, we used to go, I used to go to Glastonbury with the devotees. I was thinking when we were reading in here and, you know, they're taking drugs and, you know, they're just, you know, it's quite actually hedonistic mm -hmm. behaviour. And I was thinking it was reminding me when we go to Glastonbury. Festival. To the festival, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, to the festival. Every, you know, everybody's going there. Just to, to get hammered. Yeah, just to, mm. you know, take drugs and drink and, um, you know, socialise with the opposite sex and all of that. And um, it, I was thinking when we go into that kind of environment, it's a whole team, but Prabhupada's there on his own. And he's, yeah. you know, it's amazing to be able to be in that environment and to not only you yourself be Christian consciousness, but also raising. Everyone the consciousness else. of those around you when they're with you. It takes a hell of a lot. It's, that's so much strength yeah, to yeah. do that. I was just thinking, actually, when you mentioned the bums, and when I used to work in that house that I lived in with devotees, and I worked in the devotee shop, that was like my service. And as I walked from the house to the shop, it was all right in the centre of Brighton. And uh, I'd have to walk. I remember every day I'd walk past the same bus stop with a bench outside Waitrose. And they'd be the same guys. They were like drunks, mm. you know. And in the morning, they'd be up shouting and fighting and, you know, whatever. And then you come past on the way home and then that one of them would be like Sparko on the floor. You know, like, I just remember thinking, I oh, so, like, heavy, man. We used to call it Kali Yuga Lane, that road. It was just so heavy. But when you put your key in that door, the devotees were there, the Kirtan was there, someone was making prasadam, you know, yeah. instantly like uh, back to Vinodhu we were saying you instantly felt Above the mind. yeah yeah you just you just you, 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 you were back in Vaikuntha again having just been in hell it was quite it was it was quite amazing actually but yeah for Parabhat to do that on his own and then to do it everywhere yeah because even all the people that went out and preached on his behalf he had to he was keeping them yeah yeah it was all He's coming from Parabhat afloat <laughs> <laughs> amazing does anybody else have any anything to share?
think uh, Radha Priya must be at work. Yeah, she is. She tunes in at work, yeah. so she's with us at, when yeah, yeah. she can be. So we might get an answer to that question next week. Yeah. Uh, do you know Sharanga Mantra Chaitanya? I, I don't think we've met. No, not. I mean, on I, yeah, from Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I recognize it. I recognize yeah. everyone's names, but I don't know who anyone is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was me invited Sharanga. Yeah, he's. Um, Sharanga was uh, my assistant gardener for many years um, at, the, at the Krishna Eco Farm. Mm. Well, we're still good friends. So um, I, I invited him to. Uh, to take part in this, so um, I, I was very happy to see him tonight. Actually, um, I was very happy to see him sitting there. He was upside down, no. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you know. But I, I noticed he'd um, he'd put himself right. So thanks very much, Sharanga. Great to take part. Very nice of you to take the time because I know you're very busy and you've got a lot to do. And uh, so thanks very much indeed for um, taking part. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for letting me know about the, the sessions, yeah. Brilliant. Ma, I don't know if you saw it in the chat, Sarangi Prabhu, but Maha Mantra just, Maha Mantra Prabhu just said Harry Ball. Harry, Harry Ball, Maha Mantra Prabhu, Harry Ball. He's a, he's a Tuesday night stalwart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's always here. So, yeah, he said Harry Ball. There's this whole northern connection going on. Down, yeah. down here, we don't really know anything about what's going on up north. You might as well be in a foreign country to us. Now we're meeting everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> place. But this whole lockdown thing. I mean, I, I've met Mark Manjabu years ago in, in Brighton. So we, yeah. and, 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 and so we do know each other. But uh, it's, it's, this whole lockdown thing has been nice in that sense because... You just you sort of get out of your bubble a little bit and we get to meet all these devotees it's been fantastic to connect with everyone yeah yeah thanks for coming Sarango. really appreciate it and it's really nice hearing you read mm. that was genuinely that was wonderful thank you that was really sweet guys right, so unless anybody had anything else Arv and the kids. Have the kids got any burning questions, Arv? They're all right. It's nice hearing. I love hearing the kids read. Yeah. Oh, and they're good readers, huh? Very good readers. A bit better than I do. They're great. Fantastic. There they are. <laughs> Look at them. Gorgeous. <laughs> pair of stunners. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I, I guess it uh, looks like we're, we've had our little shot in the arm for yeah. Tuesday night Far apart nectar. we're about halfway through the chapter I think so we'll finish it we'll try and finish it, it might take us a little bit longer than usual but I reckon we'll just finish it next week yeah. and just do it and um, yeah we start sharp yeah. sometime then we can yeah, yeah, yeah. do it brilliant alright thanks everybody Hare Krishna Shri 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 Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you soon, everybody. Bye. Bye.